Today is uh, January 21st, 2024. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is the Israeli-Palestinian federal government simulation. Um, today's simulation is with uh, Hillel uh, uh, Schenker. Um, we are proposing a federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine based on a constitution based on separation between a government and religion, based on a par common parliament and a common president and vice president and a common uh, judicial branch, three branches of government that would uh, be equal to the Palestinians and the Israelis, including the people in Gaza, the West Bank, Jerusalem, and in Israel proper. We are not proposing the dismantling of the Israeli or the Palestinian government. We are proposing a common federal government that would exist simultaneously, but independently of the Israeli or the Palestinian government. Actually, independently and separately from the Israeli and the Palestinian government, a government that would derive its own legitimacy from the people of Israel and Palestine based on election that could, the election could, uh, could be uh, conducted online. We have a website, ipconfederation.org, and you can read the constitution of the common government in that website and you'll see that how the common government would be created what will be the structure of this common government like i said three branches the judicial the um um the a parliament which would be the legislative and an executive branch and um what would be the relationship between the israeli and the palestinian government and the federal government we think that if we had a federal government before October 7, we would not have had the events of October 7. And we think that it's a, a good way to make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And peace is the only vision for the people of Israel and Palestine. Hillel Schenker is our guest today. Hillel Schenker has been the Israeli co-editor of the Palestine Israel Journal based in East Jerusalem, the only joint Israeli Palestinian publication since 2002. Previously, Mr. Schenker was one of the editors of the New Outlook, the Tel Aviv based Middle East Monthly in the spirit of Martin Buber's philosophy of dialogue. He was involved in the founding of Peace Now in 1978 and served as the chair of Democrats Abroad, Israel 2012 to 2016. Mr. Schenker was born in New York. He was a member of Kibbutz Barkai for 13 years and had lived in Tel Aviv since 1985. I met with Mr. Schenker about a, a week ago, and um, we discussed the IPC formula, and um, he also suggested what legislation he wants to discuss with us today. In the future, we will have on February 4th, Professor Lior Sternfeld. He is a professor of history and Jewish studies at uh, Penn State University. At the same time, we will also have Professor Isaac Neveau. That's on February 4th. He's a Department of Philosophy at Ben-Gurion University in Israel. On February 18th, we will have Professor Ofer Ashkenazi, who teaches history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. On March 3rd, we will have Professor James Galvin, UCLA Scholar of Middle Eastern History.
on March 17, we will have attorney Ahab Masala, <coughs> who is a civil rights attorney representing Palestinians in Palestine and Israel. Excuse me a second, I need to drink a little water. On March 31st, we have Professor David Mednikoff, who is a professor of Middle East Eastern Studies and Public Policy, and I believe is at the um, University of Massachusetts Amherst. On April 28th, we will have Tony Klug, who is a special advisor to uh, on the Middle East to the Oxford Research Group and serves as a consultant to the Palestine Strategy Group and the Israel Strategic a strategic forum. Um, these are previous participants. As you can see, we had many, many simulations online. We also had simulations in person at, at universities. Um, we had, you can see the list of people who participated in the past. Um, Noam Chomsky participated twice in our simulation and recorded a video uh, in uh, support of our uh, peace formula, endorsing the peace formula. Um, unfortunately, some people either did not respond to us or refused to come on, uh, but we're trying to get them on. I'm we, here. We're trying to get as many people as possible. Uh, regardless of their political views, regardless of whether they support uh, the, uh, Palestine or Israel, uh, whatever their political views, whether they're Israelis or Palestinians, it, we invite everyone because we want everyone to stress test our formula for peace. The simulation takes 120 minutes. And this, this is a simulation. So we are going to have segments in the simulations. Each segment, we will ask Mr. Schenker his opinion. We'll ask, give him an opportunity to make comments about those segments. And we also will ask you, the audience, to participate as parliament members, to participate as the prime minister of Israel, as the um, president of Palestine because this is a simulation and we will ask you to ask questions as well. We will, uh, Mr. Schenker is not a speaker. He is not necessarily endorsing the IPC. I met with him a week ago. We'll find out what's his views, but he's not the speaker of the IPC. Then we'll have closing remarks. Um, we have a video that explains in essence, what the IPC is about, how it will function, and uh, I'd like to play it for you. It takes two minutes. The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has endured for generations, and instead of time healing the wounds, it's only caused the anger to fester and the violence to grow. But what if there was a way to alleviate the tension Something that may not outright solve every problem, but at least create a forum that encourages a peaceful compromise. Welcome to the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, a common third government between the Israeli and Palestinian citizens, specifically designed to foster peace, tolerance, and economic prosperity between the two nations. Here's how it works. First off, both Israel and Palestine will keep their respective governments. Israelis Knesset and the Palestinian National Authority will remain unchanged. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, IPC, will be a third entity acting as a unifying agent between the two. The IPC will comprise 300 parliament members elected from 300 districts in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Above them will preside a president and vice president, one Israeli and one Palestinian. In order for the IPC to pass a law, it will require a 55% majority from its Israeli representatives, as well as a 55% majority from its Palestinian representatives, thereby preventing either side from monopolizing the legislature. 
Of course, the IPC won't undermine the political power of either the Israeli or the Palestinian government. At any time, Israel or Palestine may veto a law passed by the IPC. If neither side vetoes, the law is passed. And the two nations are another step closer to resolution. Please help us make this a reality. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. We might speak different languages, but we all mean the same thing. So we are going to be simulating what we just saw uh, in the video. And I would like to conduct a pre-simulation survey. And we will conduct a post-simulation survey to see how many of the people participating today support the common government before simulation and after simulation. So let's have this uh, pre-simulation survey. Please vote now. Do you support a common government for the people of Israel and Palestine that would exist simultaneously with the Israeli and the Palestinian government? Please uh, answer the survey as soon as uh, you can. Um, should be on your screen. Okay, and I'm gonna give it another 10 seconds for you to vote. Uh, so 37 out of 40, oh, I'm sorry, 38, 39 <laughs> out of, uh, okay, I'll give it more because I see more people are voting. So I, I wanna have as a comprehensive vote as possible. Okay. 40 out of 43 voted yes. That's 93%. Three out of 43 voted no. That's 7%. Okay, hopefully we will be able to win those three into the yes category at the end of the simulation. The reason we are getting is such a high approval number is because many of the people that are now participating in the simulation have participated before and they understand what it is. They understand that it's not a threat. It's actually a good way to make peace. We are going to be demonstrating to, uh, to you and to Mr. Schenker how a common government could make peace with the Israelis and the Palestinians. We are not proposed, we are not pretending to be the Israeli or the Palestinian government. We are pretending to be the common government. That's what we are doing in this simulation. We are pretending to be the common government. We anticipate that when we have a real common federal government, it's not going to follow the Israeli uh, uh, narrative or the Palestinian narrative is going to follow its own narrative, which is the, ho the, the whole region, the people in Israel, Palestine. Like I said, Mr. Schenker was invited to stress test the, um, the that we are proposing. We will have a rigorous but respectable discussion. We do not preclude other formulas for peace. We are not saying that our formula it should be the only one uh, considered, although we think that our formula is very good and is really could make peace. And we're not claiming to be the exclusive uh, uh, formula for peace. Uh, we are not claiming that the Israeli or the Palestinian governments cannot make peace. Um, well, actually I am claiming that, but the common government is not claiming that. Um, we will ask Mr. Schenker to, um, this, to tell us whether the formula presented to him could make peace. That's the, the central question. And we'll ask him to be fair, not to, to judge our formula, not based on perfection, because it's an impossibility to reach uh, perfection, but to, to make his analysis and his opinion based on what's the alternative, not based on perfection. We are, the essence of our formula is that the common government could pass legislation that would be acceptable 
to both the Palestinian and the Israeli side. And in order to show that those legislations will be acceptable, we are actually demonstrating those legislations in the simulations. There are many, many legislations that we can show, but because we are limited by time, we only show few. This time, hopefully today, we'll show three legislations if we have enough time. And we're asking you to look at the big picture, to understand that there are many, many legislations that we, that the Israeli and the Palestinian government will have to accept. Whether they want it or not, they will have to accept because they will lose legitimacy if they do not accept. We are asking you to avoid technical arguments. We are limited by time. We're asking you to look at the big picture, not just as small details that can be um, rehashed later on. We can, we can solve the technical questions, the technical arguments, but we're asking you to look at the big picture. We're asking you, the audience, to refrain from comments, but we are encouraging you to ask questions. Questions are encouraged. Mr. Schenker will have the privilege of making comments and ask questions, but the audience, please ask questions and refrain from comments. You can use the chat feature for your comments, and you could also uh, make your comments at the end. This is a simulation. We are mimicking an operation of a proposed system. This is not a lecture. If you ask me, Joseph, how does this plane fly? That's a question. We encourage questions. But if you say, Joseph, airplanes cause pollution, that's a comment. Please refrain from comments during the simulation. You can chat about it and you can write at the end your, uh, your uh, comments. Okay, now we are getting to the heart of the simulation. This is, if you haven't paid attention up to now, please pay attention now. This is a simulation. We are assuming, we are making certain assumptions in order to make these, this simulation working. So you need to assume that we were able to spend $100 million to create an election platform online to advertise and publicize the election and to advertise and publicize the benefit of a common government, that we had $100 million to do so. And we have done it in the last year. This is the first assumption that I want you to make. I also want you to assume that there are 40, well, that's, that's not an assumption. That's actually a, 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 a fact. There are all, uh, a little over 14 million people in Israel, Palestine. But I want you to assume that the 14 million people with the exclusion of minors have been allowed to vote. That means 14 million people in, that includes the area of Gaza, the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Israel proper. I also want you to assume that 5 million people voted. The 3 million Palestinians voted and 2 million Israeli voted. I want you to assume that the president, that me, Joseph, I was elected president so that you are, it's clear, I never intend to be president. I am not even qualified under the constitution to be president because I do not reside in the area. I am a citizen, but I do not reside. In order to, to be elected, you have to be a citizen and resident. In fact, to be to vote, you need to be a citizen and resident. But I want you to assume for this simulation that I was elected by one and a half million votes. It just makes it easier for me to conduct the simulation as if we are if we are pretending that I am the president. And from now on, during the simulation, that's how I'm going to act. I'm going to act as if I was elected by one and a half million people. And a Palestinian lady was elected by 1.3 million uh, people. And we are going to rotate after two years. But for the first two years, I am the president. I want you to assume 
the 300 parliament members were elected in 300 districts. Each district is 47,000 people. I will ask you to act as parliament members. In, so you will have to choose your district. You'll have to choose whether you're Israeli or Palestinian. So at this time, first I'm going to ask the audience, do you have any questions regarding those assumptions? The audience, and then I'll go to Mr. Schenker. Do you have any questions regarding those assumptions? Please. Okay. Hearing no questions, uh, Mr. Schenker, do you have any questions or comments regarding those assumptions? Well, I, I have a basic comment that uh, we are in the midst of a severe crisis, perhaps the most severe crisis since 1948. And crisis also means the possibility for opportunity for change. And uh, we just experienced before five Israeli elections, which did not have the Israeli-Palestinian question on its agenda. And clearly now is the time for new initiatives and also to place the Israeli-Palestinian question back on the table, both for Israel, for the Palestinians, and for the international community. And so therefore, I welcome initiatives which can try to cope and resolve the conflict. And definitely this initiative is a welcome initiative. Uh, of course, there is the catch of the $100 million, which would be needed in order to carry it out. But uh, definitely it is something worth uh, exploring and promoting. So if we had the $100 million, do you see these assumptions? Do you see the possibility of achieving the assumptions and making them a reality? Okay. In your introduction, you said that the IPC would leave the Israeli and the Palestinian governments unchanged. Now, I think that's a basic flaw in the view of the situation. No, I'm because... sorry. We didn't say it to believe them unchanged. We said that we will exist regardless of whether there is an Israeli or Palestinian government. Okay, okay. The, my main point there is that we need both a change in the Israeli government and we need what President Biden calls a revitalized or rejuvenated Palestinian Authority, PLO. But uh, looking, you have to look at the, the total context. And in that sense, uh, definitely if you uh, if the IPC is able to get off the ground, it can definitely make an impact. The question is, uh, is it realistic at this moment in time for enough Israelis and Palestinians to be motivated to become involved and to vote? Uh, I, I would hope so. But uh, this would be, again, dependent on the fact that you need that means to be able to promote it. All right. So, so, so going back to my question, do you see the possibility that, this, that these assumptions could turn into reality, provided we are able to obtain $100 million to do so? Well, in Hebrew, we say halavai. If, if I would wish that it were possible, uh, there will be many obstacles. There's a tremendous, we are living in a situation where we have two traumatized societies, both the Israeli society and the Palestinian society, who at this moment in time are not looking for the possibility of solution. They're simply feeling pain, and they're also seeking, to some degree, revenge. I hope we will be able to go beyond that. And if we do, and we need many factors, not only the internal Israeli-Palestinian factor, we need the international community to also help us go beyond this. And then it would be possible to consider such a uh, proposal. And one thing that I, I would hope we can clarify 
you say a one Israeli president and a Palestinian vice president, are we assuming that this will be a rotation? Yes. This, yes. In other words, whoever first gets, an Israeli whoever gets and the then most, there would be a Palestinian. Yeah, whoever gets the most votes. You see, I was elected by one and a half million votes. Yes. That's the reason I am first president. The vice president, 1.3 million. Palestinian lady, she received 1.3 million votes. We are going to, constitutionally, we are required to rotate after two years. Yeah. It's interesting because that harks back to uh, actually Zev Vladimir Jabotinsky, of all people, the uh, who is in theory Netanyahu's mentor, but uh, the founder of the revisionist movement, which is the base of Likud, who also advocated an Israeli president and a Palestinian vice president, and then he said vice versa. Yeah, Netanyahu but he did not. But he did not propose a common federal government. No, he didn't. Right, but he was talking about uh, a essentially what we would call a binational solution, which uh, okay. a, in, I, I actually would have wanted to see happen in 1947, but unfortunately it didn't happen. All right, let's go on. Um, so um, we are now asking you, the audience, to act as parliament members. You will have to decide whether you are an Israeli parliament member or a Palestinian parliament member, whether your district is exclusively Palestinian or exclusively Israeli. And um, keep in mind that if you are in a mixed district, you could still be Israeli or Palestinian. A Palestinian could vote for Israeli and an Israeli could vote for a Palestinian. So I'm showing you a map of the area of Israel, Palestine, and I'll ask you at this time to identify whether you are an Israeli or a Palestinian parliament members. So please do so at this time by using this um, uh, voting mechanism and make your choice. Are you Israeli or Palestinian parliament members? Now, Mr. Schenker, you can also act as Israeli or Palestinian parliament member. Yeah, I'm obviously an Israeli, not a Palestinian. Yeah. Okay. So you can vote. Uh, you can choose whether you. All right. So, uh, so right now we uh, can you end the polling? Okay. So we have seventeen out of thirty-seven that are Palestinian, that's Palestinian parliament members. And, and we have 20 out of 37 Israeli parliament members. So I would ask that you would remain intellectually honest and continue to be Israeli or Palestinian parliament. And I may ask you the simulation. Who do you represent? What, what is your identity in terms of a parliament member? And I will ask you, what area do you represent? What city do you represent? Now, I also need someone to act as Israeli prime minister. Do I have a a volunteer to ask uh, to act as Israeli Prime Minister. Mr. Schenker, would you like to be the Israeli Prime Minister? Not really. <laughs> okay. All right. We need to uh, someone to please raise your hand or speak up. Are you, are you willing to be Israeli Prime Minister in this simulation? As Israeli Prime Minister, you will be given the right to vote. I'm sorry, just the opposite of what I said. You will not be given a right to vote. You will be given the right to veto the legislation. Do I have a Israeli prime minister? And we also need, oh, Jesse, are you? <clears throat> okay, Jesse, you are the Israeli prime minister. Uh, I was gonna say Palestinian if you didn't have anybody. For okay, the so Jesse, you're a Palestinian. Okay. If you, if you, uh, if no one so, else wants so to Jesse, do it. you, you cannot vote 
in the election because you're a different government, okay? You represent a different government, but you will be able to veto the legislation. I need someone to act as Israeli prime minister. If uh, nobody else wants to do it, I'll do it. This is Charles. Okay, is there someone else who wants to do it? Because Charles has done it before. Give you five seconds to decide. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, Charles, so you are the uh, Prime Minister of Israel. And again, Charles and Jesse, you are not allowed to vote. You're only allowed to you're be given a veto power over the legislation. We are simulating how this common government will work. Uh, I would like to respond to Mr. Schenker, who said, well, we don't know if the Israeli or the Palestinians, we are now at a time of crisis. Um, the Israeli and the Palestinian societies are not a monolithic societies. If they are given an opportunity, a new opportunity, I suspect that they, if we have a year to explain to them what is the common government about, how it could make peace, how it could give them security, because the Israeli and the Palestinian governments have not given them security or peace, I believe that we will have a large number of Palestinians and Israelis who will vote. I believe that what I've shown in the simulation, in the assumptions, could be realistic if we are, if we have a good opportunity to advertise and to explain what the common government is about and and how it could give both the Palestinians and the Israelis security and safety. Uh, we had a uh, we had an election before in 2012, and we had a New York Times full page in the New York Times uh, uh, um, announcing the election, and we did not have a a um, opposition by the Israeli or the Palestinian government. All right, the first order of business. Now that we have a president and we have a parliament and we have a uh, president, uh, a Palestinian and Israeli prime ministers. Um, we need to go to our first order of business, and that's to ratify the Constitution. Uh, Libby, would you be so kind as to read the Constitution? Sure. The Constitution. We believe that Palestinians and Israelis are entitled to equal rights under the law and guaranteed human rights and freedom. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation does not intend to supersede or supplant the Palestinian or Israeli governments, nor to abrogate or undermine any agreements between those governments. We encourage, we recognize the need to work with the Israeli and Palestinian governments. Our purpose is to resolve conflicts and to expand the relationship between Palestinians and Israelis in a fair and equitable manner. We believe in equal rights under the law, guaranteed human rights, and freedom for all. We voluntarily give the legislatures and the governments of Israel and Palestine veto power over legislation we pass relating to the domain of control of those governments. We believe in the separation of power between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. We believe in the creation of a permanent secular government for all the people residing in Israel and Palestine. We believe in having a separate judicial branch relating to IPC legislation with Israeli and Palestinian judges with a system to avoid biased decisions based on nationality. So the full constitution is on our website. This is the important part. We are a separate independent government of the, of the government of Israel and Palestine. The existence or non-existence of the Israeli and the Palestinian government is not essential for us to exist. We can exist regardless of whether there is an Israeli or Palestinian government. If there is an Israeli or Palestinian government, constitutionally, we are prohibited from 
um, undermining any agreements between those governments. They could agree to uh, one state, they can agree to two states, they can agree to anything they want about Jerusalem, about the right of return, about um, uh, refugees, uh, security, whatever it is they want to agree, con the, and they do agree. If they reach an agreement, we are constitutionally prohibited from undermining those agreements. However, since they are never really able to agree, we believe that our existence is necessary. We will pass legislation. And if the legislation con contradict or, or violates the sovereignty of the government of Israel or the Palestinian government, we give them a veto power over it. But if it does not violate their sovereignty, they do not have a veto power. So let me go to the audience first. Do you have any questions regarding the Constitution as you see it on the screen? The audience, before I go to Mr. Schenker, do you have any questions? Okay, hearing no questions, let me go to Mr. Schenker. Do you have any questions or, or comments, Mr. Schenker, regarding this Constitution? Well, my basic comment is that unfortunately in Israel, we do not have a constitution. We were supposed to have one by October 1948, and the, it's been delayed, and here we are in 2024. We still do not have one, although we have constitutional laws. And all of the points, the uh, values that I see listed in this constitution uh, appear to me to be very worthwhile. And uh, I would only wish that uh, we would have such a constitution for both the Israelis and the Palestinians. All right, thank you. Uh, so hearing no questions from the audience, um, let's ratify the constitution. Now, since you are parliament members, you must ratify the constitution, otherwise you will be expelled. From the, from the parliament. You can still be audience, you can still be a citizen of Israel or Palestine, but we are a parliament and in order to be part of the parliament, and by the way, when you, when you uh, became a candidate, you, one of the requirements was that you accept the constitution. So let's have the Palestinian parliament members ratify the constitution. Palestinian parliament members, please ratify the Okay, publish the, the ratification of the Palestinian parliament members. And let's, uh, they all ratified it. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Please ratify the constitution. Palestinian parliament member, uh, Israeli, I'm sorry, Israeli parliament member, please ratify. Okay. Publish the votes. All the Israeli parliament members ratify the constitution. So now we have a constitution which has been ratified and we go to the next order of business and that is who do we give a veto power to? This is legislation. It's not part of the constitution. It's a legislation because the governments change and our requirements change and we change as reality changes. So, uh, Charles, could you please read the um, granting of the veto power? Granting a veto power to the separate governments. The Confederation is the government of the entire population of Israel and Palestine from the river to the sea. We recognize the Palestinian and Israeli governments and are seeking their cooperation to implement our vision for peace by giving them a veto. We will do our utmost to satisfy the essential needs of each government. We are pleading with the Palestinian and Israeli public to understand that while we would like to pass the best legislation possible to improve their lives, under these constraints, a perfect legislation is not possible. We hereby bestow a veto power relating to legislation affecting sovereignty to the following. The government of Israel, on issues in which it is indispensable. 
the Palestinian government on issues in which it is indispensable. In the event of changes in governments, this legislation may be amended or repealed. The parliament will decide on indispensability. Vetoes may be bestowed individually or collectively. All right. So basically, if we if our laws violates the sovereignty of the government of Israel or the Palestinian government, they're given a veto power. If they do not violate their sovereignty, that means that they are dispensable and we would not give them a veto power. Um, does anyone have any questions in the audience regarding this um, veto power legislation? Audience. Okay, hearing no questions from the audience. Mr. Schenker, do you have any comments or questions regarding this veto power? No, no, I, I accept what's here. Okay, so let's have the Palestinian parliament members do use, now you can, do you support the declaration of intent to grant the veto power, Palestinian parliament members? Okay, publish the vote. 100% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of giving the veto power. And let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Publish the vote. 95% of the Israeli parliament members voted in, in favor of giving the veto power. So this given, so we have a guidelines on how to give a veto power and to whom, under what circumstances. And now we're going to go to the first substantive legislation. This is what we discussed, I discussed with Mr. Schenker and this is what he chose. Uh, Libby, would you be so kind as to, and this legislation will be given a veto power. Libby, would you be so kind as to read it out? Both educational systems to teach tolerance in their public schools. Devote a certain number of hours for both sides to teach the history of the Israelis and the Palestinians. Prioritizing teaching Arabic and Hebrew in public schools to achieve proficiency of both languages by Israeli and Palestinian students create a mutual task force to ensure the teaching of both languages. Educators to draft textbooks together and arrange for a regular exchange of teachers. Public media on both sides to provide fair and equal coverage daily for teaching tolerance. IPC as facilitator to ensure that both sides are fairly represented. We hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli government and the Palestinian governments. We bestow upon them a veto power, which may be exercised in the next 60 days. All right, so this is a legislation that we recognize the Israeli and the Palestinian governments are uh, indispensable. We need to have their uh, authority, authorization, because we're asking them to act. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions regarding this legislation for tolerance and understanding? Audience. All right, I uh, hear no questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Mr. Schenker, do you have any comments or questions regarding this legislation? Uh, I think that uh, teaching tolerance and understanding and uh, against racism is, is critical. Also, the mention of the idea of teaching the two narratives to everyone. Right. And I would add also the, important, the importance of language. I think that every Israeli and every Palestinian child should learn three languages. Uh, Hebrew is the national language of Israel. Arabic is the national language of the Palestinians and of the region. And I would add English is the global language. And so all three 
all Israeli and Palestinian children should be come fluent and exposed to the three languages. All right. My question is not really whether this is a good legislation. Obviously, it is a good legislation. My question is, does this legislation makes it clearer why a common federal government is a good idea? Does this legislation uh, bolster the idea for a common federal government? Mr. Schenker. Oh, you're asking me? Yes. Uh, no, obviously, uh, this would help, no question about it, to uh, bolster the possibility of uh, understanding between the two peoples within the context of a federal government and in general. Okay. So if someone said, well, show me an example of the Israeli and the Palestinian governments agreeing, this would be a good example, wouldn't it? Yes, yes. All right. Steve, you have a question? Steve Kaiser. You need to unmute, Steve. He's typing in the chat box, um, Joseph. He's typed, the issue is who gets to occupy what land? And he wrote it twice. OK. That's not the issue presented before us now. You, you can't change the, the discussion. The discussion is we have a common government and we have a legislation. Now, if you want to suggest legislation, then that's fine. But you cannot kidnap the conversation into another issue. Um, Bess, do you have a question? Yes, so would this or any other legislation supersede any legislation already existing in Israel or Palestine? Yes, if the Israeli and the, the Palestinian government agree to it, yes, it, it does supersede any, any legislation that contradict this legislation. Um, Let's go to the Israeli Prime Minister. Mr. Prime Minister, are you going to veto this legislation? Hey, jo Joseph, can I can I ask you something? Yeah, before this, Because I, I think this was one of the legislation that I contributed to. I, 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 maybe it was before. Um, yes. About the, the language. The, the other, um, in addition to teaching toleration and stuff, there's another important factor that I think that could be added to this, is that this type of measure also ushers in cooperation in terms of business, economics, research, development. And that's important too. Of course, because, that goes without saying, yes. Yes, yeah. so I think that's that's probably because it, it in a sense, it, it gives it a more practical why we should do it rather than we should do it just to understand each other, but because we need to do things together to develop together. Yeah. Um, Mr. Israeli Prime Minister, are you gonna veto this legislation? Um, well, <clears throat> hmm. um, I, in terms of creating a mutual task force to ensure the teaching of both languages, um, I would say that that would have to be something that uh, we would appoint the members of uh, at least the Israeli side of that task force, and um, that anything that comes out of the um, work of the task force would have to be once again submitted to our approval. If those two changes could be made to it, then um, we would consider it. Well, it says in cooperation with the Israeli and the Palestinian government. Where, where does it say that? Um, you can assume that it says that. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> All right. no, are, you, are you are you gonna are you gonna veto this legislation? Um, I, unless unless the Israeli government has control over uh, the you know our 
we we would appoint the task force. Okay, you want to have control over the Israeli narrative in the teaching of the history. Yes, of course. Okay, that's fine. That's there's no question about that. But the we are teaching both narratives. We are not choosing the narrative. We are teaching both narratives. Uh, I understand. I understand that you're teaching the narrative, but what the narrative is that you will be teaching will have to be something that you know we will create. Yeah, the, the Israeli history will be created by the Israeli side. The Palestinian history will be created by the Palestinian side. The teach the people the the, the people of the the students in Israel Palestine will learn both histories. I understand that, but. Um... The, there's, there's nothing that uh, stipulates Israeli control over the creation of um, the Israeli aspect of the mutual task force. So I would have to see that before I could consider something like okay, that. Okay, look, you're arguing details here. Okay, look at the big picture. All right, well, then I will veto it. You would veto, okay. Um, and the, because it's not, it's not detailed enough? Because because it doesn't it doesn't spell out the uh, control of the Israeli government over the creation of the oh, okay. Israeli you, narrative you, in the task force. You have my assurances that, that that the Israeli side will have control over the Israeli history in the in the teaching and the Palestinian side. But just told you that. Well, I know you just told me that, but but. That's that's like you know verbal agreements are not something that work here. It has to be written into the. Uh, okay, uh, Palestinian parliament members, do you do you um, do you uh, veto this legislation? You mean the Palestinian government? The Palestinian government, the Palestinian president. Um, I I'm not going to veto it in unless would there be an issue if. The uh, Palestinian side of history, um, you know, from Ramallah tried to be uh, caught in Gaza and people resisted. Would the Palestinian government be uh, penalized for that? Um, wh what's the process for that? I don't want to veto this legislation, but I also don't want to make things worse off. No, you will. You will. You will commit to teaching to allow your students, Palestinian students, to learn the history that your government believes is the correct history, but also what the Israeli believe is the correct history. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the issue here. That's the stipulation here. Okay, I, I will not veto. Okay, all right. Um, let's go to the next legislation and that is um, <coughs> Gaza. Um, Libby, could you please read the first? Oh, I'm sorry, did I give Mr. Schenker? Oh, yeah. Um, Libby, could you read may, the first May I make a comment about the two narratives? There are role models out there of uh, efforts to already do that. For example, uh, one of the members of our editorial board is Professor Eddie Kaufman. And he, together with Professor Manuel Hassassian, who is today um, a Palestinian ambassador, I think to Hungary, if I'm not mistaken, but he was a professor and dean at Bethlehem University. They taught for 14 years every summer the two narratives at the University of Maryland. So oh. there are role models to learn from in order to be able to apply. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. That's very good news. All right, let's go to Libby. Could you read, please, the, the first page of the legislation? All right, this is Rebuilding Gaza and Southern Israel. The IPC is the only government in Israel and Palestine that was legitimately elected by the entire population. The IPC elected 300 parliament members in Israel and Palestine, with approximately 125 of them being elected by the people of Gaza, 
and the southern Israel area near the Gaza-Israel border. Over 5 million people in Gaza and Israel are directly and personally affected by the violence that has occurred since the events of October 7th and beyond. Thousands of homes, roads, and infrastructure buildings, including hospitals, have been destroyed. Law and order and civil society have been destroyed in Gaza and southern Israel. It is unlikely that the Israeli and Palestinian governments will be able to restore normal, peaceful existence in the area in Gaza and the southern Israel in the foreseeable future. The future of the people of Gaza and Israel is interconnected. The IPC parliament is obligated to the well-being of all the people in Israel and Gaza, including those constituents who were displaced from their homes in Gaza and Israel. The IPC is committed to rebuilding Gaza and southern Israel and ensuring the immediate return of all the people in Gaza and southern Israel to their homes. All right. Uh, next page. The IPC is calling for immediate ceasefire between Israel and Gaza. The IPC is calling for the immediate return of all political hostages and prisoners to their respective jurisdictions. The IPC is calling for the rebuilding of Gaza and southern Israel by requesting a $50 billion grant from the world community, including the Israeli and Palestinian governments, to aid in the rebuilding of the areas in Gaza and southern Israel affected by the devastation. The IPC will remain the legitimate government in Israel and Palestine with jurisdiction in Gaza while providing veto power to the Israeli and Palestinian governments on matters that affect their sovereignty. The Israeli and Palestinian governments are bestowed a veto power over this legislation. So we are the only legitimate government in Israel, Palestine. We are the only government that was elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. We have 300 parliament members. I believe 150 of them, uh, let me see, 125 parliament members are in Gaza and Southern Israel. We represent the people of Gaza and Southern Israel. And we are saying that the Israeli and the Palestinian governments are unable to give peace and security and are unable to manage the area of southern Israel and Gaza. And we are um, passing legislation to give us the, the, the exclusivity, so to say, to manage that area with the consent of the Israeli and the Palestinian government. So let's go to the audience first. Do you, audience, do you have any questions regarding this legislation? The audience. Yes, I do have a question. Um, one thing that I'm concerned about is that, okay, we're just we're discussing a simulation, but the situation with Gaza right now is even if everybody was to return back to their homes, the hospitals and universities are out of commission and will probably take years to build. So wouldn't there be a, a provision where, for example, we say that people who are students, like university students, for example, and people who need immediate hospital well, care. What is right your now, question, Nasir? My question is, is that we have to have something that solves the problem right now, the immediate people who are in school that are not going to be able to go back to classrooms because their universities and schools are destroyed, the hospitals have been destroyed, that they're able to, rather than say, go to Sinai, That's not come a to the West Bank. That's not it, a question. It, it is That's a question a because you're not including that. You're saying That's we're going to rebuild. That's not a question. Okay, so let's ignore the fact that these people's, that the infrastructure has been totally destroyed and will not be built for this. That doesn't make sense to me. So just everybody's going to wait for four years, five years for this stuff to be rebuilt? That's not a question. I'm asking you why is why cannot we include that where they can where they can have access to go to the West Bank for hospitals and universities and schools for the people of Gaza? Oh, okay. Um, that's a question. And um, 
Uh, why not? Because I, because I really we, didn't think about that option. Well, that, well, that's why, because I'm thinking as a Palestinian. I mean, we're going to yeah. go back to North Gaza, and guess what? There's nothing to grow to. Right? The universities are going to Okay, so, so you're saying the IPC to coordinate. Yes. To coordinate and facilitate movements of Palestinians from Gaza to the West Bank. Yes. Okay. Then let me um, let me try to uh, to add that. Yeah, because we're always given this option, like why don't they go to Sinai? Well, we have the West Bank. Why do we need to send people to Sinai for hospitals or for refugees or something, or even inside forty eight areas? Okay. Uh, Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, hi, Armin. Hi. Um, now, do these simulations, when uh, this proposed legislation is modified, does this build on each other? Because I participated the, the last session, and I thought we modified uh, some things, and, and I don't see those modifications. So is this, a, do we start from zero every time there's a, a simulation, or do, do these documents build well, on uh, input that has been uh, submitted in previous uh, simulations? No, it should, it should build on previous simulations. If there are changes that were not included, it probably my fault uh, for not including it or either I forgot uh, because usually with the PowerPoint, it asks you, do you want to save? And I usually say yes. So I apologize if there were some, uh, some amendments that you suggested that was not included or maybe it was not included because people did not vote for it. That could be. But generally, if there is an improvement, of course, we try to improve it. Okay, because uh, I noticed something that wasn't included. Also, oh, you um, can send me an email on that, and I'll 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 include it. Okay, it had to do with uh, um, prisoners. Uh, yeah, we changed that. We changed prisoners to political prisoners. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So yes, the, the, that was a discussion, and we we changed the verbiage to political prisoners. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, actually, I do have another question. Um, now, when uh, Palestinian and Israeli perspectives are taught in each other's schools, uh, I don't see anything about attendance in those schools being mandatory. Yeah, that's that's. You know, that's the, the technical, the technicality of how to implement the legislation. We will, of okay. course, work on that if there is, yes. I mean, we're not going to just pass the legislation and leave it at that. No legislation. There are always regulations after legislation. But, you know, we, we're looking at the big picture here. Right. Okay. Thank Any you. other questions? Yes, Joseph, I have a question. I would like to add that Israel should Number one, uh, have all the Gazans that are injured and, and sick coming to Israel, to the Israeli hospitals. Israel would uh, pay reparations of about, I don't know how many billions of dollars, and Israel would build all of these houses wherever these people want to build them. Yeah, it's not, it's not gonna pass. 
it's not going to pass. Nothing will pass, you know, if you think about no, it. No, it's not going to pass if you, if, look, I, I support what you're saying, okay? But we are a common government. We have Palestinian and Israeli parliament members. We are not here to, to punish one side or another. We're here to make peace and to pass legislation that both sides will have no choice but to accept. If you pass legislation that would punish one side over another, then they have an excuse not to <laughs> accept it. Okay, forget the punishment, but they will they will have to live someplace. They will have to have uh, accommodation. They will have to be to to use hospitals to, to get medication to get water. All of these things are immediate. So how do yeah. you handle these immediate needs? Well, Nasir spoke about that, and he spoke about the. Uh, movement of Palestinians uh, to the West Bank and Gaza. I agree that there has to be, but but give me a solution. Don't give me a problem. You are a parliament member, okay? You need yeah. to give me a solution. Don't just pose a problem for me and say, Joseph, solve it. No, I, I, my, my solution, my proposal would be to, to build accommodations in Israel and to, to basically import all of these people to Israel and, and to the West Bank, wherever they want to go. But yeah, but I, I'm not to... going to suggest that because I know the Israelis are not going to accept that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. it, 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 it has to be a something that I am the president, okay? I was elected by one and a half people. I have the, the people have given me the judgment to decide what legislation, or really, it's a parliament. You're, if you, I, I am not a parliament member. You can pass your own legislation. But right now, in my judgment, I, I want to pass legislation that will be acceptable to both sides. And what you are proposing to move the Palestinians from Gaza into Israel because of the devastation that happened in Gaza the Israeli parliament members will not agree to that. All right, yeah. uh, Mr. Schenker, do you have any comment or questions? Yes, including I, I, what you just heard. Yes, I have a few comments. First of all, uh, uh, having the Gaza Palestinians move either to Sinai or to Israel is a non-starter. The Egyptians will not accept that and neither will the Israelis. What we know we will need is essentially a Middle Eastern Marshall Plan, similar to what happened uh, after World War II to rebuild uh, Western Europe. And that's what this is proposing, this uh, item. Now, yeah. in order to carry it out, it will need major international funding. And right. for that, what the Palestinians, I think, understandably are saying, and also the Arab world are saying, is we need an end to the occupation and the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel as the condition for being able to carry out this major rebuilding. Because we're living in a period of multiple tragedy. First, are, are, you, are you saying that the common government will not be, impl be able to implement it, this legislation it will, if it we will receive not be able to raise the funding unless certain elements are carried out and uh in other words the goal is worthwhile and but you then need the support of the international community and the Arab world and there are certain conditions which will have to be met before that can be done but this is urgently needed because we have multiple tragedies. First, we okay. have the October right. 7th so, tragedy, so, and now we have the ongoing Gaza tragedy. Okay, so you're saying you're saying that, in your opinion, the the, the um, common government and me as the president will not be able to achieve the fifty billion dollar grant unless there is two state solution. Essentially, yes. That is okay. what the international community, what the Americans are saying, and what the Arab world is saying as well. And they would be the ones who would be providing the funding. Okay. So what I am going to do as the president of the common government elected by one and a half million people with election for five 
that 5 million people voted. I am going to campaign worldwide. And if any president of any country in the world refuses to give us any funding on that ground, I am going to put him to or her to shame because I will say that that's a, uh, a, 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 um, a poison pill that is basically uh, 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 trying to a uh, uh, trying to um, uh, pull on the people of Israel and Palestine and have them swallow it because of their failure to create a two state solution. I am I will be telling the the, the world the people of the world, the governments of the world, that they have failed and we came up with a, with, we came up with another solution that is far better than their failed solution. And they cannot create a, their solution as a condition to the, to what we have. Now, if Israel and government, and the Palestinian government want to create a two state solution, by all means, but this is a absolute necessity at this time. And if, for example, the US government refuses to give us, uh, or the German government, or the French, or the refuses to give us funding, I will personally, as the president, put them to shame and say, you have given us weapons. You, have, you, have, you are part of this devastation without reaching the two-state solution. And now we want to create, to give uh, uh, the people of Israel and Palestine, we want to save them from your inaction and you are trying to create your failure as a condition for giving us uh, uh, support. So shame on you. But but I, I think you're missing a, a major point, Joseph. The Arab world, the, especially the Gulf countries, are saying, why should we front the bill because of Israel's aggression? It's a double coin because the that's, United that's States. A, that's a different That's well, a different. Well, but argument. what I'm saying is, we, OK, let's that's a in, different argument. But how many times was Gaza rebuilt after these wars that Israel started? Because the Western countries are the ones well, who are we, financing. This is the wars. first time we have a common government. It's a different ball game. But, sure, but sure. The are only you thing telling is, me that Saudi Arabia will say we are not giving you, we are not supporting other Muslim people <coughs> because Israel created the devastation? And I just think that it's I just think that it's ridiculous to tell these countries, hey, front the bill for the West that gave Israel billions of dollars for war, and Israel that did the war to destroy Gaza, and hey, you guys pay for it. That's ridiculous to me. Well, because it, yeah, I mean, it may be from, ridiculous to you, but but the, the the governments that support the war, that have been oblivious to what's going on, will be put to shame. No, no definitely, definitely because they didn't. But 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 oh, I just asked a question real quick because Professor Hillel said something that was interesting. I agree that he said that that Egypt. We definitely, it's a non-starter because Egypt will never accept the uh, Palestinians uh, going to Gaza, but he said Israel would not reject such a thing. I, I don't think I agree with that. I think that the, this government's uh, dream at night is for the Palestinians to go into Sinai and never come back. But and, it won't happen. But that's, 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 no, I know, that's I know not it won't of, happen, but you said that it's a no, non-starter because they we're don't not gonna, We're not going to divert from what, let's have the Palestinian parliament members please vote on this legislation. Palestinian parliament members. Did you make the change that I... Yes, All right. I did. All right. Palestinian parliament members, please vote. Okay. And 91% of the Palestinian parliament members voted on this legislation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Please vote. Okay, 75% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of this, this legislation. Um, so is the Israeli prime minister, are you going to veto this legislation? Um, <clears throat> yes or no? Uh, 
Well, we're in the middle of a Charles, war. Charles, we have another legislation. We need to move forward. We're in the middle of a war right now, so. Are you gonna veto this legislation? Probably, yeah. Okay. Um, so I am, I am going to, again, I'm gonna embarrass you worldwide to say that you are good at devastation, but you are not good at rebuilding. You are a danger to the people of Israel and Palestine and that you should be removed. Let's go to the Palestinian <laughs> parliament members. Are you going to, I'm sorry, the Palestinian president, are you going to veto this legislation? Uh, well, I'm going to be seeking reparations uh, for the rebuilding. Are rebuild you going to veto this legislation? Uh, no. OK, good. Thank you. All right. So you have to understand, I have a political power here. You guys do not have the political power. The parliament members are representing 47,000 people. The uh, president of the prime minister of Israel represent a, a segment of the Israeli society. The Palestinian parliament, uh, the Palestinian leader represent a segment of the Palestinian society. I represent the whole area. I have the power, the political power for the whole area. And therefore, I am going to use that power to benefit my people. And my people are the people of Palestine and Israel. All right, let's go to the next legislation is make peace with Iran, Lebanon, and Syria. Charles, would you be so kind as to read this legislation? Make peace with Iran, Lebanon, and Syria. We are the parliament members of the federal government of Israel, Palestine. We are the only legitimate government in the region. Our people have experienced wars and violence for over a hundred years. The Israeli and Palestinian governments have failed to bring peace to the people in Israel, Palestine. Therefore, we are taking the initiative to protect all the people in Israel, Palestine and provide them with peace. To achieve this, we are forming our own delegations to directly meet with the authorities in Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, and Iran for the purpose of making peace in the region. Our intention is to demand that all these governments and entities agree to cease violence and threats against each other and work towards a lasting peace to work as a facilitator and promoter of peace between these governments. Our goal is to be fair and objective and to expose any governments or entities that pose a threat to our people. All right, so you notice there is no veto power here to the Israeli or the Palestinian government. We are the government, we are the legitimate government of Israel, Palestine. We are elected by the people of Israel and Palestine and we want to negotiate peace between Israel, Iran, Israel and Lebanon and Israel and Syria. Does, the people in the audience, do the people in the audience, do you have any questions regarding this legislation? Questions? Okay, here. Okay, three participants. Okay, so let's, what is your question? Uh, um, Sumava, Sumava Basso, what's your question? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, this is Somava from India. And uh, my question was exactly related to this part. I mean, in this uh, legislation, we are taking into consideration the Iran, uh, Lebanon and Syria, other countries of Middle East. But in, similarly, I just also had a question related to the previous legislation that where Professor uh, Shankar said that, you know, uh, about the funding but the Marshall Fund, I believe that there are several uh, uh, funds which were provided by US, but uh, those were mostly for allies. But, and I, I think we should also take into consideration that if funds are provided, I'm not saying that Middle East sponsors terrorists, but there are these sort of, you know, the terrorists. Well, what is your question regarding this legislation? Yes, so the question is regarding, the, I mean, if we provide funds, we should also take into consideration the fundamentalist and terrorist group who could also be, who could also use oh, this. Okay, function. that's not a question. That's a comment regarding the previous legislation. Do but you have a question? 
Do you have yeah, a so question I, regarding this legislation? So my question is like, why aren't we taking into consideration the other uh, uh, broader Middle Eastern uh, countries? Like the, since the, like this, this legislation mentions Iran, Lebanon and Syria. So this was my question. Right. So are you saying, why are we not negotiating peace between uh, Pakistan and uh, India, for example, or between Syria and Iran, or between Iran and uh, and Saudi Arabia? No, I'm saying, like, while uh, talking about the peace between Israel and Palestine, why aren't we taking into consideration the other Middle Eastern actors? Because it they have also played a significant role in the Cold War. Okay, it's because we have a ongoing violence between Israel and Iran, between Israel and Lebanon, specifically with Hezbollah. We have ongoing violence between Israel and Syria, and we want to live in peace. Therefore, we are creating a, our own delegation because we are the people of Israel, Palestine. We want to live in peace and we want to have peace so that we would survive and not suffer war. And those are the countries that we currently identify that need to make peace with Israel. Uh, Maisar, Maisar al-Samadi, do you have a question? Maisar, please unmute. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, if we're talking about making peace with Syria, should we not include uh, uh, or mention the return of the Golan Heights to Syria? Whatever it takes. We want to go to Syria. We want to speak to the Syrian government and, and ask them, what are your conditions to make peace? And then we go to the government of Israel and tell them these are the conditions we want to expose both sides to see why are whatever it takes thank, and then we will you. take and then we will take a vote yeah, as a separate government and we'll try to get the Israeli and the Palestinian and the and the Syrian government to create peace yes okay thank you Isa do you have a question Isa Isa I'm sorry it's I'm not Isabella, I'm Isa. Yeah, okay. Uh, Isa, my Isa question Co is Co Cocher. 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 Isa Cocher. Isa Cocher. Isa is Arabic Isa. Isa Ibn Biryan. So okay. uh, my question is I lived in Palestine. I taught in Palestine. I worked in Palestine. And as far as I know, uh, since 1917, no Palestinian has had their uh, human rights recognized by any international party or by Israel. So how can any of this be done without first recognition of the people of Palestine as human beings? That's my question. We recognize the people of Israel and Palestine based on the constitution. We have a constitution that recognizes the equality of people, Israelis and Palestinians. That's the, the basis of upon which we are elected and how do we operate based on the constitution of Israel-Palestine. Don, do you have a question? It doesn't make a, uh, it doesn't make a, a, a hill of beans difference if Israel and the United States refuses or uh, any other international body refuses to recognize Palestinians as people. I am sorry, it does make a hell of beans. I was, we were, we had an election. Okay, thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Don, yeah. you have a question. Uh, my question is, what about the Arab nations to be part of the meeting with this delegation? And who would be the authorities, authority in Gaza? Who is the authority in Gaza at this time? Would be in this... Uh, legislation, who would be the authority? Are you presuming Hamas? It's a fluid situation. We're not presuming any Palestinian government or Israeli government at this time. <clears throat> it's a fluid situation. If we have difficulty 
implementing our legislation, regardless of who will be uh, imposing that difficulty, if, if that difficulty is uh, we are unable to, to, to overcome that difficulty, in other words, if they become dispensable, then we give them a veto power. Okay. And what about the Arab nations like Egypt and Saudi Arabia and so forth? What about them? What You wouldn't want them to be part of this delegation to meet with? We are the delegation of the people of Israel, Palestine. We are, we see at this time the danger of a war between Israel and Iran and Israel and Lebanon and Israel and Syria. Now, if there is a danger of war with Egypt, we will consider doing it with Egypt. But Egypt is not part of our delegation. We are an independent delegation of people, the people of Israel and Palestine. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay, let's have the Palestinian parliament members please vote. Palestinian parliament members, please vote to give us the power to have the delegation. All right, 100% uh, of the Palestinian parliament members who voted, voted in favor of this legislation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Israeli parliament members, please vote. Same thing, 100% of the Israeli parliament members. Hi, though, I did have a question. Can you hear me? I unmuted. Yeah, is that rain? Yes, go yeah. ahead. So to me- what, What's the, the question? Um, isn't the ability to create a peace treaty part of the sovereignty of a government? And so unfortunately, perhaps wouldn't this have to be open to veto? from the Israeli or Palestinian governments. No, we, we, we can do this. We can create our delegation, whether or not the Israeli or the Palestinian governments veto it. We, we can create it. We can literally, and we are creating it. We are the people of Israel and Palestine. We can s s fly to all these countries and demand to speak to the governments and then fly back to Israel, Palestine and demand to speak to the Israeli and the Palestinian government and, and, and to expose the Iranian, the Lebanese, the Syrian and the Israeli governments to the public and to, to demonstrate that one side is unreasonable in our, in our opinion, and therefore we want to reach a legitimate a legitimate and, and reasonable agreement in order to prevent possible harm to the people of Israel and Palestine. And we so don't- you're, to... you're, my question, it's just kind of a clarifying question. My question is you're acting as like a kind of independent negotiators. No, we're not. We are the independent government of Israel, Palestine. We are the legitimate government of Israel, Palestine. We're not. Well, then, it, then why would you ever grant? Then okay. So then, why would would you ever grant veto power to either of those governments? And when if you're because granting... because if they can prevent us from implementing our legislation, we have no choice, and we give them a we give them a veto power. No, but it doesn't make any sense to give them a veto power. Of course, they're going to veto everything. No, well, I just demonstrated. Were you here? Especially the a, Israelis are going to veto. Pass legislation, we pass legislation. We pass legislation, and 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 we're on on uh, on teaching tolerance. We pass legislation on. Yeah, on, but the Israelis vetoed it. 
Yeah, the Israeli uh, prime minister veto it. Yes, that's true. In and this, the in this simulation, him. in this simulation, yeah. he did. But that doesn't mean that we will not have the proper political power in reality. And by the way, I, I appreciate the question because you're you're hitting the heart of the of the matter here. I yeah. believe that if we are elected yeah. by 5 million people, we will have the political power to force the Israeli and the Palestinian governments to accept legislation that benefits their people and exposes their failure to give peace and security to the people of Israel-Palestine. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I just think that this last one on negotiating peace would be particularly sovereign, uh, a thing that okay. sovereign states do. But what you're saying is it's more of a, um, coming back with a maybe a negotiated settlement that either the Israeli, Syrian, Lebanese governments accept or don't accept. Look, this legislation is actually, in my opinion, the easiest. We can we can negotiate regardless of whether Israel or the Palestinians want us to negotiate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's our lives that is at stake here. Well, I'm not I'm not against it. I'm just trying to understand the mechanism around uh, waging yeah, war and peace. I appreciate but, that. But no, I think and, it's and a I very appreciate... very interesting. This is a very interesting, um, like vision. This is a very interesting vision. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Uh, so I think we passed this legislation and we are going to form our, our committees and we're going to negotiate peace and we're going to, to try to force the, peop the government of Israel and all these governments to make peace and to, and to reduce the threat over our, our people. Guy, do you have a question? Guy Frankel. Unmute, Guy. I'm trying my best, guys. Uh, I'm not super familiar with the interface. So, Joseph, just for clarification, it seems like it's less about peace between Israel and Palestine and rather declaring Israel slash Palestine one entity that will then go and negotiate peace with third parties. Is that the concept here? That's the concept in this legislation. But it's not the total concept. It's not the overall concept. The overall concept is to have peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. This is just legislation to demonstrate the benefit of having a common government. Any other questions? All right. Having no other questions, let's go to a yeah. post simulation survey. Wait, can I make some comments about uh, that uh, element? That uh, sure, that sure, yes. No. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, some personal comments about uh, uh, Syria. When Syria and Egypt attacked Israel in 1973, I ended up being mobilized, and I was on the Golan Heights for seven months, and. When the war ended, I personally resolved I will not go back to visit the Golan Heights until there is peace with Syria. And I think it's possible. And there have been attempts, but the, it's possible. Now, concerning Iran, particularly, and also Lebanon, between 2010 and 2015, I participated in a series of regional conferences for a weapons of mass destruction free zone with Iranians and Lebanese. Now, uh, Egyptians and Jordanians and Palestinians as well. Now, these the, all of these governments have until now failed to achieve the peace that this proposal is calling for. And so therefore, the idea of having the IPC, which essentially is a third party besides the governments, Entering into the picture and trying to promote this, I think, would be very worthwhile. Mm. Cool. 
Um, okay. Looks like Joseph stepped away for a second. I would just say this, and which is something that is often overlooked in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, since Oslo, and that is that the, the actual effect of the surrounding Arab states, Israel's relations with the surrounding Arab states, and that part of that being the, um, the diaspora of Palestinians within those nations affecting the relationships both with of Israel to the Palestinians within the areas that they militarily control and also with their relations to those other states. I mean, I think, you know, this, this legislation to me might be one of the most achievable ways of actually bringing the Palestinians and the Israelis within Israel closer yeah. together because you can't, I don't think you can separate those relationships, the, what's happening inside of Israel and what's happening between Israel and the United States and also uh, Israel and the surrounding states. And also I would throw the United States into that mix as well. Anna, you have a question or comment, a question, sorry. Yes, um, I'm speaking from the UK after many years living in the States. But before that, I worked with Professor David Bohm introducing dialogue here and other places around Europe. But also, we introduced two dialogues in Tel Aviv. This was a long time ago, back in the 90s. But we had um, Palestinians, Jewish people, Christian people there, all talking together and it got very hot, but everybody stayed at the table. My question is, at a grassroots level, how can one introduce that spirit of dialogue, that um, space for dialogue amongst people to discuss their different points of view and really listen to each other, hear each other? Well, we are proposing a common government not a dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians. We are proposing a common government based on a constitution and based on election and based on uh, uh, similar interest and, and based on openness, opening the legislation, a system of government. It's not just to have Israelis and Palestinians sitting on each side, each side thinking in terms of their side. We are a common federal government that we see the whole area it belongs to all of us. And we do what is necessary for all of us to benefit all of us. Um, yes. I think it's admirable, but I think people grassroot, at the grassroots level, people need to be able to talk together in yes, friendship. Yeah, well, absolutely. That goes as without well as saying, but, but, the, but, but what we're saying is that there has to be a goal, not just talking. It has, mm -hmm. to, it has to be a goal. It has to be a system, something that to help us move forward. The Israeli and the Palestinian governments, in my opinion, are not the goal. They are the problem. They are preventing the people of Israel and Palestine achieving peace. What we need is, in my opinion, a common government to achieve peace and a system to create the common government. But let me go to the, we'll, we'll go to open discussion in a second. Uh, Let's go to the uh, post simulation survey. After participating in the simulation, do you support a common federal government? Please vote. Okay, give it. Uh, 10 seconds more to vote. 
Okay, uh, so we have 23 out of 26, 88% voted yes. Three out of 26, which is 12% voted no. Interesting, we started with 40 out of 43, 93% voting yes, and three out of 43, 7% voting no. So we actually have a different number of voters, and uh, but as the absolute number, we did a little worse in terms of yes, we got more no in this in this time. Um, I so I just want to make one more comment before we go to open discussion. I believe that a common government, a federal government, can bring peace. It is very realistic to create the election. Uh, Mr. Schechner said um, the big question is how do you get a, a hundred million dollars? One week of war between Israel and Palestine, I'm sorry, between Israel and Gaza, one week is $3 billion. One week. They've been going on for years. And in the last round, it's been over 105 days. And it's funny, no one is asking, where do you get the money for that? But when it comes to peace, which is a, a drop in the bucket in terms of the financial need, $100 million. $100 million is being spent there sometimes in one hour. The question comes up, well, could you get the $100 million? That really tells us, do we really want peace or we do we subconsciously want to continue with this war. The current government of Israel is not a legitimate government. It's not elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. The Palestinian government are not legitimate government. They are not elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. I am proposing, or we are proposing a democracy that could bring peace for the people of Israel and Palestine for the 14 million people and end this shameless, uh, uh, savagery that is going on currently as we speak. So this is what we can also buy for a hundred million dollars, or in my opinion, we can create a common federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine. So I'm gonna open now to a uh, stop sharing. I'm gonna open up now to a open discussion and you can ask questions. So if you want to ask questions, or Mr. Sheckner, do you have any comments regarding uh, before we go to open questions? No, I'll be happy to hear questions and respond. All right. So raise your hands now if you want to ask questions, please. I'll give you some moment to, to, to gather your thoughts. Sean, go ahead, Sean. Mr. Schechner, when you said earlier about the Golan Heights and you said there should be no weapons of mass destruction, and you said you're not going to go back there until uh, there's no, uh, there's none of these things. Uh, like uh, right now, it's a hostile area, and you said there should be no weapons of mass destruction in a hostile area. Is that what you mean? Well, I, actually, I referred to two different things. Uh, when it comes to the question of uh, the fate of the Golan Heights in Syria, the Israeli-Syrian relationship, there has to be a negotiation. And I believe that there are formulas that can be worked out. For example, uh, giving, I know that the Syrians want the Golan Heights back for their sovereignty, but it would be then a demilitarized zone. And there's an idea of a peace park, et cetera. The issue of weapons of mass destruction is a separate issue. That was more connected to Iran and Israel. And so that was another issue, which obviously we need a Middle Eastern weapons of mass destruction free zone. 
and there were attempts, there were discussions about this between 2010 and 2015 towards the NPT, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Conference. Unfortunately, they did not produce a result and uh, we have to get back to that. So those are two separate issues which are in a sense interconnected. All right, uh, Charles and then Steve. And then uh, my SAR. Uh, uh, Mr. Schenker, would you agree that, um, I mean, from, from my perspective, the, this uh, conflict is never going to be resolved until there can be a perception of justice um, for the Palestinian side in this, and that that can only be achieved. It, to me, what has happened in Gaza repeatedly is that they've said they don't want partition. And the Israelis, uh, a large portion of the Israeli public doesn't want partition. So it, it, that seems to be that if you're gonna put those two things together with, with justice, then that the only uh, solution would be an unpartitioned state that had equal rights for everyone, which seems very far away from our current political situation but the IPC is basically trying to thread that needle to bring about facts on the ground that become the bridge to a just solution. And I'm, I'm wondering about if, you, if you're looking at it through that kind of a lens, well, first of all, would you agree with that um, characterization of the conflict? And what do you think about that possibility? Yeah, okay. Well, uh... The problem is that uh, from the Israeli side, the overwhelming majority of the Israelis who are talking about a one-state solution are talking about a one-state solution without Palestinians having equal rights. So that's obviously not going to be acceptable to the Palestinians. I have here, uh, I referred at the very beginning to the concept of a binational state, and I have the road to a binational independence for Palestine was a memorandum that was presented by the Hashemirzia Workers' Party in Israel to UNSCO, to the UN in 1947. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't accepted. The, only a minority of the Israelis and hard, of the Jews and hardly any of the Arabs and the Palestinians accepted it. So now here we are, and at this stage, even if, you know, the majority of the Palestinians would prefer a one-state solution, they would be very happy with a two-state solution. And I think that that's the realistic goal that Israelis and Palestinians can work towards. At the same time, the idea of the IPC and, and Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, and there are a number of other proposals that are out there, uh, there is the um, a land for all two states, one homeland, and there is Yossi Berlin and uh, Hiba uh, Husseini who have the Holy Land proposal. And there is Professor Alon Ben Meir at NYU who is proposing an Israeli-Palestinian Jordanian confederation. All of these ideas are ideas which are very, I think, each one of them worthwhile and exploring. And uh, hopefully we will be able to reach a point where we have, as you say, justice and security for both the Israelis and the Palestinians. Hillel, uh, none of those uh, proposals are for a federal government, correct? No, they are not for, they are for a confederation, not for a federal government. The IPC is unique in uh, proposing a federal government. All right, let's go to Steve and then my sar and then chander and then rain and then isa uh, mr shenneker uh, the conversation you referred to did it ever touch on the issue of israeli nuclear weapons <clears throat> yes of course in and other words what the, was, the, ahead, the, the discussion was to uh uh reach a weapons of mass destruction free zone for the entire region that means 
Israel, and that means Iran, and you know, Saudi Arabia has said that if the Iranians gain nuclear weapons, then we will want nuclear weapons as well. What we need is a weapons of mass destruction free zone. That was what was being discussed at the uh, NPT Review Conference, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is under the UN auspices. Actually, the Finnish deputy uh, under Secretary of State was the facilitator going back and forth. Unfortunately, we did not reach that. Now, one of the things, for example, Shimon Peres, who is one of the fathers of the Israeli nuclear program, has said he too, before he passed away, said he was in favor of a weapons of mass destruction free zone. But he said, we can only reach that after we have comprehensive Israeli Palestinian Arab peace. So definitely it means also preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons, but also ending the Israeli nuclear program as well. That well, is I think it's ideally we, the whole earth should be a nuclear free zone. Yes, but I don't yes. see the Israelis releasing those nuclear weapons. I mean, they developed in the first place to deal with hostility uh, entirely around them. And especially with what happened on October 7th, I don't see the Israelis letting go of that. And well, I, I like this whole idea. I mean, idealistically, it's another, you know, effort at trying to create a world that we all want to live in. But I, I just don't see the the players on either side, the Israeli government or the Palestinian government, yielding up their their sovereignty to this. And and I wish they would, but I, I just feel they're not really dealing with the real issues. And the and the real real issue is the land itself. Oh, well, the issue, I think, is also uh, security and, as people have mentioned, justice for everyone in the region. And if we do reach a uh, Middle Eastern comprehensive peace agreement, not only between the Israelis and the Palestinians, but between everyone, uh, Professor Johan Galton, who is the founder of the peace studies discipline has rec has proposed a Middle Eastern common market sort of modeled on how the EU was, was developed from a European common market with Israel, Palestine, an independent Palestinian state, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt all working together. If we can reach that, then also we should be able to reach a weapons of mass destruction region as well. Of course, until we get there, obviously Israel is not going to voluntarily give up its nuclear option. All right, let's go to Steve. Oh, we've been to Steve. Uh, my son. Well, yes, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, I just want to clarify the issue of uh, uh, the uh, secular nature of the government. I appreciate that the constitution did stipulate that uh, that the government would be based on separation of of uh, religion and government. Would that concept apply to the constituents as Israel and Palestine as well? Only to the government. Only to the confederate government. You mean. Correct. Only to the federal government. The federal government will be a, a secular government separate between religion and, and government. Now, if the Israeli or the Palestinian government or individual people choose to abandon religion, it's up to them. But right. the Constitution uh, uh, prescribes that the it is based on a federal government that separate between religion and government. Thank you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I can't hear you, my sir. You need uh, to. I apologize. Uh, I personally agree, you know, I mean, secular government is uh, the preferred Root, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. but that might not be acceptable to Israel, for instance. You know, well, yeah, but this, this common government will be created regardless if it's acceptable to Israel, to the Israeli government. It will be created independently of the Israeli or the Palestinian government. That's the whole point. 
but the individual components, the, the Israeli portion, if you like, local government, if you want to call that, that does not have to be secular. It's for them to decide. The Israeli government could decide if they want to be secular, but the Correct. common government will be created, whether the Israeli or the Palestinian government consent or not, independently of the Israeli right. or the Palestinian government. All right, let's go mm -hmm. to uh, 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 Chander. Yes. Chander <clears throat> Kana. Yeah. Yes. I'm uh, 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 Indo Canadian. Uh, although I, uh, in this parliament assimilation, I'm a Palestinian from Jericho. Uh, my question is this, that would it be possible, conceivable for IPC to pass or consider a legislation which would dictate the rules of conduct of uh, conflict, armed conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the future? The reason I'm saying it is this, the two countries, uh, China and India for the last 60 years have been at conflict. They are the third, the they have the third and the largest armies in the world. They're nuclear powered. They have the nearly, nearly, nearly state of the art industrial scale killing machinery. But the conflicts that have taken place in the last 60 years on the it's 4,000 kilometer border no guns, no shooting, no drones, no killing, no shelling, hand to hand combat. Hand to hand combat, and people have died. In the, hand in the frozen waters of the 18,000 feet high lakes or rivers or whatever, but no shooting, no killing, no hand grenades, no landmines, nothing. The rules of conduct. So is it possible, conceivable for IPC to consider at some point the rules of conduct, not between Iran and, Lebanon and Israel territory or Syria or Jordan or other countries, but between the common government, Palestinians and Israelis of that region? Well, that's a wonderful idea. Uh, first of all, I invite you to write that legislation that would be, in your opinion, acceptable to both sides. It's a very intriguing idea. I am very much supportive, but you have to keep in mind that in order for the legislation to pass, you need to come up with legislation that, in your opinion, has the uh, ability for Palestinians and Israelis to accept. I agree. I agree. Okay? I agree. So, you know, send me an email, josephavisar at gmail.com, and propose a legislation. We had Thank other you. people propose legislation that that did pass. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. All right, Thank let's you. go to Rain. Rain, you raised your hand before. I don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll, if you want to come back later, that's fine. Let's go to um, Isa. Isa. Well, this question was for uh, C.D. Hillel, Mr. Hillel. Uh, since uh, the first Zionist uh, Congress, a land without people, a people, a, la a land without people for people without land, and since 1917 and the Balfour uh, Declaration, the people of Palestine have never been recognized as having human rights or actually even being people uh, for over a century. So how is this going to make any difference now? When is Israel going to begin to say, you know, people in Palestine are humans and actually live there? Okay. Well, first of all, uh... That phrase, um, a, a land without a people for a people without a land, actually was not an official part of uh, the Zionist movement. It was uh, something that was said by, um, first of all, Christian Zionists and also by uh, the writer Israel Zangwill, but it was never official policy. Can and I make so a quick interruption? But yes. Uh, according to Harry Truman, that was the official Israeli well, position. No, no, but Harry Truman. He really, said so. Well, uh, I don't. Harry Truman then didn't know the history. That was not the case. But uh, well, that's the what they told it, him. Who told him? The, the Zionists and the Israelis when they were negotiating the the uh, uh, Israel. The establishment the of the United of States said we will not accept. 
Palestine unless you get rid of all the people. No, no, no. That's, that's, what, he uh, that, that's what he says. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. That's not the history that I'm familiar with. That's and absurd. We then, we then take it to that's the next That's what he step. says. It's, it, okay, you can, okay. You get the video from yeah. uh, YouTube. Yeah, okay. I'll look for it on YouTube. But the fact is that at the... Um, in 1993, the Oslo Accords were a mutual recognition between the Israeli government and the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So there was an official recognition of the existence of the Palestinians. Unfortunately, it has not been taken further. And that's the challenge that we as Israelis and Palestinians have to meet. We have to reach the point where, yes, both Israelis and Palestinians have equal rights. Uh, my preference is in a, two equal states. There are others who will say in one state. He said you want to respond? Or... Well, I read the Oslo Accords differently, and other people at great length have explained how the Oslo Accords do not give human rights to Palestinians. But uh, the agreement is that Israel will always be in charge of uh, the people living in Palestine. Uh, Apparently, that's what it says. That's what I've read uh, everywhere. The, the Oslo Accords were to a, a degree flawed because they didn't really outline the end game of having a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. I'm not talking about the end game. I'm talking about the people, the people having the human people. rights. Well, having Not human rights means to be country, able to. But the people in Holy Land having human rights. They should. They, in order for the Palestinians to have full equal rights, they should have an independent state of their own. That's not true. People have rights as people because they're people, not because they belong to a government. What you're no. saying is racism. I'm sorry, I can't agree with this discussion at all. Really, no, uh, okay. it just it just denies it denies the reality of what's going on. Can we so I just lower my hand. Sorry for interrupting. What, what is it that, about the IPC, Isa, that bothers you? What is it that... If everybody's going to deny the reality of what's actually there, then why, why, should we, why should we waste our time talking about it? Because, I mean, you just told me that I don't know what I'm talking about, that I don't know anything. But I have several master's degrees. I've been teaching, and genocide has been a major part of my education for 60 years. And I just deny the fact that I don't know anything. You said, and I'm what, sorry, what I'm being told like? that I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't think it's very polite. So I don't, I don't understand the discussion. Isa, what is it that the IPC denies, in your opinion? What, what, what is... I told you in plain, simple English exactly what I meant to say. I, I, and I said what I meant, and I meant what I said. So I was just told, no, none of that's true. And I don't know shit from Tainalo. So why, why keep asking me? I'm sorry I interrupted. I'm sorry I interrupted. There are two different people here. There is Hillel Schenker and there is me. Okay. We do I'm not. I'm sorry I interrupted. You don't want to hear what I had to say. You've told me now three times. You don't want to hear what I want to say. And I don't know anything. I don't know shit from Chinola. So, I mean, fine. Go ahead and do what you want. I don't want to hear any more what he has to say at all. Let's move on. All right. Let's go to Samir. Samir. Okay. Hi. Yes. Hi, Make everybody. Short, not, not big speeches. Already. Hi, everybody. Uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you, uh, Hilal. Uh, yes, uh, your idea of uh, comprehensive peace in the Middle East, that's a good idea. And uh, it was started uh, in 1992. And uh, it was the Madrid Peace Summit or International Peace Summit in 1992, where uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Syrians and the Jordanians and the Egyptians 
uh, even the Saudis uh, attended uh, that. And it was uh, to discuss really a comprehensive uh, just peace in the Middle East. And it was going very well uh, until uh, Rabin and uh, Shimon Peres uh, went uh, after they uh, uh, got uh, elected. Uh, I mean, Rabin was elected as uh, prime minister. Uh, they went secretly and uh, talked to Arafat secretly and cooked the deal of the Oslo Agreement, uh, which came out to be in, uh, in September uh, 1993. Uh, and uh, killed the uh, the Madrid uh, 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 talks, uh, which was uh, I mean it was the right thing to do because I mean it was held under uh, uh, the uh, UN and it was attended by uh, uh, the Americans and the uh, the uh, the Soviets at that time were Russians. Uh, by uh, Gorbachev and uh, W. Bush, uh, W. H. Bush, and uh, it was the right thing. I mean, it was done under the UN auspices. Uh, while I mean, when they uh, went to uh, to uh, uh, Oslo, uh, uh, it was a deal between, supposedly between Arafat and Rabin, or between the Israel and the PLO. And uh, uh, it went on for a while, but at the end it failed in 1995 when uh, uh, Rabin, uh, one day he decided, and that's uh, according to uh, General Pellet, which I met back in 1986, and uh, General Pellet, he was, you know, a general, a colleague of uh, Rabin, and he was with two-state solution, and uh, he was very happy that Oslo uh, agreement uh, happened, but uh, in uh, February uh, 1995, he was very disappointed when he came back home uh, to uh, tell his uh, family, uh, Miko and uh, Nurit, Nurit yeah. uh, his children, to tell them that Rabin doesn't want peace anymore. And he was very uh, uh, disappointed. And uh, the next month in March 1995, he died. And then uh, a few months later, eight months later, the uh, Rabin assassination uh, came in November, and that was the end of uh, Oslo Agreement. So, I mean, at that time, uh, everybody noticed that uh, uh, there, there was something wrong here. Why, I mean, the uh, Oslo Agreement failed when uh, Rabin was assassinated, and that's the end of it. Uh, and uh, the thing that later, I mean, everybody realized that the reason the Oslo Agreement didn't uh, survive because uh, it was not under the uh, UN auspices, obviously. Uh, and then later, uh, when Tahut uh, Barak came back and, uh, to be uh, the uh, uh, the prime minister, and that was in uh, 2000. He started uh, the uh, uh, Camp David uh, uh, summit uh, in 2000. And that was also at the same time, Ahud Barak tried to revive the Syrian track. And he held talks with the Syrians. Uh, at the same time, uh, he was doing also the talks with the PLO, with the Yasser Arafat. And he tried to uh, revive the uh, two-state solution, and uh, and again, I mean, uh, what was missing with both talks, 
it was not under the UN uh, auspices. Even though, I mean, at the end of, of, of the year 2000, uh, they discuss, I mean, between the uh, PLO, Yasser Arafat, and, uh, or I mean, he was the head of the uh, uh, Samir, Palestinian Samir, can you get, can you get to, to, to the, to the yeah, point yeah. you want to make and yes, ask the um, question? What is yeah, the point you right. want to make? We all know yeah, they yeah, failed. Yeah. That's is, right. The, that the point that uh, 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 the same that with, even though I mean the almost agreed on everything, the uh, borders and the uh, issue of uh, uh, Jerusalem and the uh, refugees. Uh, I mean, it was all done, but it was at the end of the Clinton administration, and it was like I mean, in 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 uh, January twenty. I mean. Uh, um, 2001, and even though also they reach almost like 99 percent agreement with the Syrian track, all of that stopped when Bush came out. I mean, came in, and after that, it went dead, and. The same reason, I mean, it was not under the UN auspices and there is uh, no obligation and it went away. But still, the idea of the co comprehensive peace under the UN is my point and is the right thing to do. And what started in Madrid, that's the right thing to do to include all parties and have a comprehensive peace. And that is still missing until today. That's what's missing. There is no way of having whether I'm in a two-state solution or one-state solution or any solution, you cannot propose that uh, isolated uh, just between the Palestinians and, and, and the Israelis. It has to be with all parties, all Arab parties involved, plus it has to be under the UN with Russia and the United States to be involved in it under the United States, uh, under the UN umbrella. The point is directed at whom? Uh, Who do you want to respond to your point? No, I, I don't need any. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> just my comment. <laughs> OK. Uh, there is no response. I just wanted to to say that uh, his idea, I mean, uh, Hillel uh, Schenker, thank you that you brought up All the right, idea, let's go, let's which go is good him. and yeah. valid and still good, I mean, until today. Thank All you. right, Hilad, do you want to respond? Yeah, okay, yeah, very briefly, uh, I agree definitely that it would be very desirable if the UN could assume the auspices of the whole process. Unfortunately, there, it's very difficult at this stage to get yeah. a resolution via by the Security Council. Uh, at the same time, uh, the fact is that one of the things that is being talked about as part of the post-Israel-Gaza war is to have another international conference. And I hope that uh, as sort of like a second Madrid, and I would really hope that we could revive all of the process that began at Madrid after this fighting ends sooner rather than later. And I'll just mention, by the way, that my Palestinian colleague at Palestine Israel Journal, Ziad Abu Ziad, was the head of the Palestinian delegation to one of the working groups after in Madrid, the arms control group. So everybody was, you're right, everybody was represented and was involved, and that we have to get back to that. We have to revive that. All right, let's go to uh, Thank you. Sumava Basu. Sumava Basu, please. Yes, uh, so I just had a quick question uh, to Professor Shankar and uh, like uh, Professor uh, Avesar had been uh, uh, during the discussion, the question of religion came up. So I had a quick question on this, like uh, when uh, is it really in this uh, current war, which is uh, post October 7, do you think religion has a role in this current conflict? Because uh, we haven't seen any particular religious, whether it's in the side of Israel or uh, Palestine, to uh, uh, issue such statements or uh, 
derogatory, uh, derogatory remarks or any sort of aggressive uh, uh, statements of, of claim. Uh, uh, it is more like as some historians like Rashid Khalidi has stated, it's like a colonial war. And uh, some historians have also stated it's like an apartheid uh, uh, fight against apartheid regime. So I just wanted to know your views, like uh, like uh, India, Pakistan, where religion plays an important role. Do you think the modern is the Israel Palestine Palestine conflict or the war in Gaza has any you know role of religion? Uh, uh, unlike the historical, I just wanted to know your views and would be very happy if Professor Avesa also wants to have any. Suggestions or respond? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, both Israel and then we can look at Turkey and we can also look at the Palestinian national movement all began as secular movements. We know in Turkey right. and Israel, we know that it was Zionism was essentially a secular movement. And we know that the PLO, its official position was a democratic secular state. Now, unfortunately, what has happened is that in the three areas, in Turkey, obviously, but also we're particularly concerned with Israel and Palestine, the role of religion has increased and it has not been for the better. On the Israeli side, we have messianic Jews who want to who say it's only our land god promised it to us we have the right to settle everywhere in the west bank and even in gaza and of course on the palestinian side hamas is saying essentially we want a, an islamic state run according to the sharia uh, and there's no room for the israelis to have a state of their own so religion at this point has been actually playing a rather counterproductive or uh, problematic role as it grows in both Israel and Palestine. And I know that there are also humanistic trends within religion, and I would like to see them gain strength, strength both in Israel and Palestine. But the important thing at this stage is we need to resolve the national conflict and not and not allow it to become a religious conflict, which may not then be at all uh, resolvable. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything you said, but I would like to add one more thing. It has been escalated in the last, uh, since October 7th, it has been escalated into mm -hmm. a religious war, which makes it, this war very very dangerous because uh, we've seen Netanyahu using uh, Amalek as yeah. the, as an excuse or or I don't know if it's an excuse but as a background for whatever it is that Israel is doing and they and it 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 is becoming very very similar to what. The, the the religious war that we read about in the Bible, yep. there, and and that's very very dangerous, and that's one other reasons why the Israeli and the Palestinian governments are such failure, and that's another reason why we have to have a common federal secular government for the people of Israel and Palestine. Yes, and I would add also that Netanyahu is really a manipulator because he is a totally atheistic, secular man who is using religious, when he talked about Amalek, he's, you know, he himself is not a devout Jew. He's totally secular, and yet he's using this because he also needs these extremist messianic people to, otherwise he doesn't have a government. Yeah, I agree. So, so just uh, a quick... Uh, uh, okay, um, do you... Uh, we are now an hour and nine, two hours and nineteen minutes into this to this event. Does anyone have any more questions to ask uh, Mr. Schenker? And then we'll we'll conclude. Sean, quick question. Okay. Said, is there any way I uh, can make a? It's not a question. Uh, I've been listening on and off. Hey, Sean, how you doing, man? If you want to go ahead of me, yeah. go ahead. Okay, I just want to ask okay. Mr. Schenker about something, but if you, okay. 
All right, let's uh, let's have Edward ask a question because he hasn't asked a question yet. Edward. Yes, uh, uh, my greeting for all. Um, uh, it's not a, a question, it's just a observation of what's going on today. Uh, me as a Palestinian who live under the first Intifada, and I saw how we brought the whole uh, war together uh, to recognize us and brought PLO back and uh, PLO start negotiation, whether it was under Oslo or with Madrid, there was an intention and was a true intention that to, you know, to come together. Arafat brought everybody together, including me, and we thought, okay, this is a possibility. After this time of the collapsing of the, you know, the negotiation and all of this, now I am, I'm watching the whole entire Zionist society going to the extreme more and more. You know, I'm 52 years old. I lived the first Intifada, the second Intifada. I thought there was a chance to do it. But from what I see in the other side, uh, listening to like social media, uh, there is a, a young 20 years old um, uh, Palestinian um, influential in, so, in social media called Observer or uh, Hamas the Observer. And he reached out to Palestinian, I mean, to Israelis kids. What I found today that none of these kids even recognize who we are. They don't even believe there is Palestinians. They don't even believe there is Palestinian right, ancient light to the land. And I understand the Zionist state unite its citizen under fear. This is the best thing they can do. They bring the fear. And I know most of the one who control this state is, you know, none of them have anything to do with Judaism and, uh, you know, the history of Judaism. So as a Palestinian, I'm seeing today the, the reaction of the, uh, you know, the streets of, uh, you know, the Israelis. How, where, how, how, how we can go, like how I can convince my son when I'm hearing the new generation of Israelis, today they are going too much to the extreme. They don't recognize you, they don't see you, they don't, you don't exist. You are just a fake, fake name. You are invaders. You came through the Arab, uh, you are Arab, Arab nationalists. How I can convince my son there is possibility of peace. Even though I do believe the only solution I, ca I can accept as a Palestinian is the common government, with how, how, you know, this group are, you know, uh, you know, offering. That's the only way. I'm not looking for Palestine or, or Israel. I'm looking for equal right in my own state. I'm looking for equal right from the river to the sea to every one of you. But how do I, I convince my kids today, these people are, my partner of peace, where I see the extreme is hitting every age of the state of Israel. Thank you. All right, let's go to Guy. Guy, you, you have Thank you, question. yes. Thank you so much. I, I really uh, was hoping. You need to unmute, Guy. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much. I was uh, hoping for the opportunity uh, to talk to Said. So, um, Said, uh, I'm still here, my friend. I'm still here. Yeah. First of all, I uh, hear you and the frustration in your voice and what you're saying is right. Uh, within our lifetime, I'm 50. I think you said you were around 50. Uh, we've seen We've seen our people move from hope to of peace to um, very close to um, you know um, war of annihilation. Let's call it. And um, I, I've spent the last twenty five years hopeless uh, since the the end of uh, you know Rabin assassination, the second intifada. I couldn't see a, a way uh, forward. And I hear your pain. I hear that you want to move from this uh, bloodshed of a situation so our kids can have a better future. 
Uh, and I can't imagine, well, I can imagine, and I want to speak to it. Uh, I've seen people, uh, and I know people, who deny uh, the existence of a Palestinian people and who say the Palestinians are uh, Arab residents, Arab immigrants should go back to uh, where they came from and leave us alone in our land. And I think that's a genocidal thought, not in the way that even death is involved, but in the way that you deny a peoplehood of a people and the people will no longer exist as a people. Genocidal mentality. Yes. And the idea that there will be no people, right? They will be alive, but as other, as a different thing and lose what they had as people. But then I hear the way that uh, you talk about Jews and Judaism. And I think that maybe for lack of uh, speaking to enough Israelis and Jews, you're doing something similar. And I might be wrong, right? This is why I wanted to unmute. Because my frustration, because I seek Palestinian allies all the time. And here and there, I find brothers, right? That I can call brothers. I have one in Ramallah. Recently, I made one in a refugee camp in southern Lebanon, which I'm really hoping will survive, uh, you know, the, what's happening in the north right now. But when you say Judaism, and I hear this, maybe not from you, Said, you can speak for yourself, but from so many, too many Palestinians, you think of us Jews as the third religion. I come from 13th generation, uh, Palest what you guys call Palestinian Jews, right? From Jerusalem, old family from Jerusalem. And you're saying in the old days, we had Jews and we had Muslims and we had Christians. And by telling that story, you are denying my peoplehood. You are reducing my peoplehood to a religion. I'm not religious. Zionism was not a religious movement. It's a national liberation movement of a people. And when we say, Jews, you are not a people, you are a religion, then that is very similar to saying, Palestinians, you are not Palestinians, you are Arabs. It, it's eliminating the element that we hold most dear. We say Am Israel, it means the people of Israel. We think of ourselves as a nation, as a people, the same way that you think of yourself as the Palestinian nation. And I think that any future that well, is- if any, if any way I can, uh, Is any way I can make a little comment to my friend? Please, please interrupt me for sure. It's a conversation on a speech. Yes. I don't know how uh, to mute uh, uh, yeah, let, 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 guy, let guy finish and then, and then that's an interesting conversation that is being developed here. And I'd like to make a comment about that. Yes. Yeah. So, so Guy, if you can finish, and and I think we I mean, understand I, where you're I mean, going, and then and then Edward, and then and then I will I will I will love to answer him, uh, Joseph, okay. if you let me, because let, I let, I got let, the point. I got let, the point. Yeah, but but the Guy needs to finish, and then you'll speak. Joseph, okay. I feel like I finished, and I made my. I could say more words, but I do feel like my thought was uh, understood. Yeah, my you, friend, you can uh, read your thoughts. Okay, uh, Edward. Uh, I, 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 nice to hear from you, and I'm looking forward to debate you in a, a reason to educate myself and educate my people as I did with uh, Michael Bloom. Uh, it was an honor to meet somebody like Michael Bloom and speak to him as a Palestinian and understand where he's coming from. But you cannot blame me to understand you when you do not understand yourself and your state. For the past 75 years, my friend, the state of Israel does not have border to recognize. The state of Israel does not have a constitution. The state of Israel, every leader who come from Ben Gurion to, uh, to Netanyahu is an Ashkenaz European uh, prime minister. And you call it a Jewish state that is violate every Jewish law of the book, my friend. So it's not about me how I'm looking at you. When I have 70 ethnicities who united in my homeland today with 90 languages today and you call yourself whether you want to call it a zionist or you want to call yourself any entity you, you you call yourself you still does not know what to call yourself i get confused myself to call you you are a zionist you are ashkenazi you are a sephardim 
uh, you are Jewish. I don't know what to call you. And I'm looking forward to understand you and understand what is the future of this nation and how we can find the common ground to live together. It's not me. I am myself a Palestinian. I spent two years in prison. My cousin got assassinated yesterday. His name is Taufik uh, Ijak, assassinated with one bullet. And he's a US citizen, 16 years old son, 16 year old age, a US citizen yesterday, two, two days ago. And you could see my page on TikTok. I'm, you know, mourning about it. I'm trying to understand you. So who you are and how I can approach you. For 75 years, you didn't have a constitution. Who am I to you? We all confused to understand who we are. That's the, my let's, point. Let's, let's go. Let's can, go to Hillel and then go back make, to guys. Yeah, some, some comments yeah. about this. First of all, uh, uh, Said, I I hear what you're saying, and I'd like to point out two initiatives. One is at the Palestine Israel Journal, which I'm the Israeli co-editor of. We have 15 Israeli and 15 Palestinian members of the editorial board. And even in the midst of this horrible, tragic war, we have a WhatsApp group in which we're having an ongoing dialogue and ex respectful exchange, recognizing each other's rights and aspiring towards a peaceful resolution of the conflict and seeking ways of going ahead to do that. Now, in addition to that, Yes, a lot of young Israelis were tremendously traumatized by what happened on October 7th by the Hamas attack. But, but Hillel, um, you're not responding to what the exchange okay. that is going on. You know, I, 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 I am. No, I'm, 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 what I'm pointing out is that there are young Israelis. I recommend to Saeed that he look at the organization Standing Together. Standing Together are young Israeli Jews and Palestinian uh, Israeli Hillel, you citizens need to respond to what's going together. on right now in our screen. Guy is saying that that uh, Edward does not recognize him or his uh, identity. Edward is saying the exact same thing. Yeah. That, and, and, and the question is, and I'm pointing out that there are some Israelis and Palestinians who are recognizing each other's identity and being respectful of each other's identity and also are seeking ways, are acting in the streets and in the media to overcome the current conflict out of respect for each other. All right, Guy, do you, do you want to respond to Edward? Yes, I'm oh, not sure. sure. I do very much, but I'm just seeing Saeed and you're calling him Edward, and I'm not sure which one is this. I see Saeed. I think Saeed is uh, Edward uh, is the name that uh, I think it's, it's me. His, it's uh, me. American it's, I'm name. No one, I'm no one in the social media as Edward Saeed. My son ah. name Saeed, but ah. I am Saeed. Uh, go ahead, sir. You are Abu Saeed. What are you? Huh? All right, Saeed. Uh, listen, I hear you when you say. Um, don't blame me for being confused. Uh, you Israelis seem a little bit confused as well. Uh, my answer to that is, you're right. It is confusing in general. And on top of that, it's an internal conversation or argument or battle within Israeli Jewish society. So I'm giving you my absolute understanding of it as if it's an answer in math, and the answer is two, you know, one plus one. It's not. It's more complicated than that. And I've had arguments with religious Jews that will say something similar to what you're saying to me. You're not a people. You have a covenant with God. Either you do it or you don't, and you're not really a Jew if you don't. So forget a people. You're not even really a Jew. Not a bad Jew, but just out, right? The Rambam has 13 principles of faith. And if you don't abide by them, which I don't, bye-bye, according to some. But I'm speaking as an Israeli and the Israeli understanding. We don't have a constitution. All we have is the Declaration of Independence and then some constitutional laws that were written to try to explain to ourselves and to the world who we are. 
So when I speak as an Israeli, and when I think of the Jewish people in the framework of Israel as opposed to American Jews, I, I think of Israelis the same way I think of uh, Palestinians. We're a people. Some of us, like even in Palestine, right? Some people believe that really your association is bigger and maybe it should be an Islamic giant state and the loyalty is much larger. And you would reject that and go, no, I have a national Palestinian identity. So within Palestine, there's different visions. And especially historically, if you look historically, it wasn't clear what the national Palestinian identity would look like. Would it include the... Jordanian Palestinians, now we know, you know, it's river to the sea, there's Palestinians. And between the river to the sea, there's the Jews, you know. And so that's how I would think about it. What you want for yourself as a Palestinian people, person, that's what I want for me and my people. And I want it for if, you. I if, want you it allowed for me, you. if you allowed me to say one sentence, yeah, I don't care what you call yourself. I don't care what you, if you belong there or not. All I care about, I need equal rights like each one of you, as equal as you, to be free in my country. And call it whatever you want to call it. From the river to the sea. I want to be free. I want to have equal rights like you. And that's what I'm looking for. I don't get that. I don't care what you call that. I don't call who's your history. Give me equal rights like you, and let's live together. That's right. And... Well, the best solution I, is I one say, secular democratic state. I don't think you anything less. I don't think, you again? I don't think you deserve anything less than what I deserve. Beautiful. I think, if I, think I can, that's people. why that's why I can join your WhatsApp. I can contact you. I can educate you and bring more people to to be part of this because there is dark energy, and there is dark light. That taken over and destroying my life and your life. I cannot get rid of you. You cannot get rid of me. What is the solution? Keep going this way. Every crazy man comes here and take like a Sinwar or Netanyahu or whatever you want to call it. I need to live in peace. I need to be equal to every one of you to live freely. If we can bring this together, and I believe the common government, what's Mr. Joseph Joseph Avasar is, you know, uh, offering. Is the only solution because I don't want to be part of you. I don't want to go to your restaurants. I don't want to go to your settlements. I just want to be free with my own territory and with my own community. Just let us be. Let's find this way. Let's find more people to speak about this and fix your issue, not letting extremist people control you as equal as I am losing a lot of liberal Palestinian to Hamas now, because if we run an election, if Hamas did anything right now, we are losing. Liberal people are called traitors and snitches. That's what they call me today, you know? So if we're gonna allow this to happen, both of us are gonna be vanished, whether you like it or not, we're gonna suffer. So give, let's see who can change the, the fact. I could bring so much Palestinian who speaks like me and came from the, the suffering, came from the prison system, and they did time in the Israeli prison. They believe in equal right. I'm not here to eliminate you. I'm not here to kick you out. I'm not here. I don't give a damn if you believe in Moses or you believe in the monkey. It's not my problem. My problem is I want to be equal to go visit my family in Akka without anybody telling me who I am. Yeah. I, totally agree agree with everything. I agree with everything that you just said. Yeah. Do you mind if I just conclude with one, one sure. thing? I just want to recognize, Saeed, that everything you're saying would be brave and amazing any day. Uh, the fact that you lost your nephew uh, yesterday uh, and you're still here with us today uh, working towards peace uh, just blows my mind and I admire you very much for uh, for that. So thank you. Yes. If you go to my and, TikTok and today, my brother, if you go to my TikTok today, I am the most influential Palestinian in TikTok who speaks Arabic in America. I have over a million followers. Now I have one over uh, around 100,000 people following me. And now most of the people calling me traitor because I'm a friend to Joseph Avasar. Mm. Traitor. This guy speak to Jewish. 
He's not one of us. I am in live, you know, debating Zionists. A Palestinian come down and say, get rid of Edward Said. He's a traitor. He speak to, he, he was recruited by the Mossad agent, Joseph Abbasar. Sure. <laughs> Wallahi. <laughs> Actually, Allah, the best, I'm, I'm not, actually, I'm not lying. The best, solution, the best solution is one secular democratic state. And that doesn't require negotiation, does not require anything. No, you it, just... isn't, isn't that what we are <laughs> proposing? Yes, one secular that, democratic that's state. Why, that's why I'm here, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I'm here. I, even I lost my cousin. Even they call me at 4 o'clock today, wake me up, tell me you, the American embassy in my town, the, every American channel is in their house because we, we are Americans. We pay taxes like everybody. And he said, please, Saeed, be the spokesman for any American organization going to reach out to us. You represent the family. For the death of the 16 years old kid who want to learn Arabic and uh, tradition. I am burning right now, but I'm not blaming you because I know you are the victim too. The victim of who? Of us not being strong enough to show that we have the right to live together. To allow mm -hmm. Ben Gafir to control you and Sinwar to come out and eliminate 30,000 to be the reason of eliminating 30,000 Palestinians and call this a victory. This is shame on me. All right, guys, um, we are approaching almost uh, over two and a half hours. And um, I, 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 first of all, I want to uh, thank Hillel. You are wonderful. You're very generous with your time. If you want to make a concluding statement, but otherwise we'll have to close because it's almost over two and a half hours. Sean has something. No. Sean? No, the, the only thing that I would like to conclude with is that I, first of all, hope that the fighting will end as soon as possible and that we can take the opportunity of this crisis to move forward and resolve the conflict uh, and enable everyone, Israelis, Palestinians, and everybody else in the neighborhood to have legitimate human equal rights. And uh, I hope that the IPC can also contribute to that. So I'm going to have to leave. Oh, thank you. Assume that, you know, thank you, Hillel. You were very generous. I thank really you, appreciate Hillel. your time. Okay. And thank I want to thank everyone thank and so hope you come to our next simulation. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay.